Welcome to the second episode of the third season, Spotlight, of the fourth podcast. I'm Ali Wazir. I'm Ibrahim Ali. And I'm Talha Mohammed. And you can help us grow by giving us a follow on Instagram at thefourth.productions and Twitter at thefourth underscore prod, P-R-O-D. So thank you all for joining us again for another season of the fourth podcast. So this week we have with us our second special guest of the season, Hira Hashmi. Hira, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, jazakallah khairan for having me on. The theme of this season is uh, visibility. In episode one last week, we talked to uh, Zeba Khan about visibility and how she struggles with that through kind of uh, her experience, which is as a disabilities advocate and also as a female board member at her local mosque. It was a very enlightening episode on what visibility really means for minority groups in this country. You are also a, a a minority, so do tell us about yourself and what aspects of your life have made it difficult to be visible. Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. So just a little bit about me. Um, I was born in India, and so our family, we immigrated here when I was very, very young. Um, I was raised in Colorado, so Colorado is not diverse at all. I was one of the few... Um, people of color at my school and beyond that I was one of the only people who wore or women who wore hijab and so a lot of my high school career was very much defined by um, the sort of dynamic between the way that you're perceived and the way that you want to be perceived especially as a Muslim Um, there's always that aspect of or that pressure that you feel like everyone here is going to look at me as a representative of Islam and sort of how that plays out throughout my high school and college career. And then, of course, in college, I gained a little bit more recognition being the MSA president um, and working with different groups on campus. And then, of course, on a more national level with my work with Muslims Condemn and really just bringing to light a lot of the problems that Muslims face on both a community level and like a national level. So alhamdulillah, it's been a learning experience since then. And of course, we can get more into detail. Um, I don't know exactly like what aspects to discuss, but it has been very much a learning curve and just being able to work with the community on the ground. It gives you a lot of insight as to, you know, what, you know, Muslims are going through, especially in today's political climate. I don't know how many people uh, know this about you, but I think you first started, uh, one of the first things uh, that I remember from you anyway is the books that you started writing when you were very, very young. I was wondering, since you're a bookworm, how do you feel about representation of minorities in general, Muslims specifically, in like young adult fiction, the books that kids and young teenagers or even adults read in this country and how you've tried to make a a difference in that aspect of entertainment? Yeah, of course. So there's two aspects. One is writing or producing media as a Muslim. So the books that I wrote had very little to do with Islam or very little to do with being a Muslim. They were like, you know, enjoyable, short fiction books. Um, So that's one aspect is being a Muslim who produces content, Um, whether it's like, you know, commonly being a YouTuber or, um, you know, I think Rami recently won a Golden Globe for like, I don't remember exactly what category it was, but he, you know, he, he, he acted and wrote that show Rami on Hulu that's gotten a lot of attention um and so one is like being a muslim producer and sort of the struggles that you have to go through to do that and i know a recent controversy online anyway was with the hala movie which was written by a um uh like it i believe she was pakistani like a pakistani writer but the content of her story was one that a lot of people saw echoing a lot of the stories that other people write like that typical muslim girl falls in love with a white boy And so that started a lot of conversation on like, okay, if we're going to write as Muslims, what does that mean? Um, And then the other half of that story is the representation of Muslims in media. And that is a place where I think that warrants a lot more. It's it's a little bit more straightforward to me because um, it's more about like how it's not about the types of stories that we want to tell. But in that realm, that conversation is about 
how are Muslims being portrayed? And I think it's gotten a little bit better, but there's always like that Orientalist ch touch. I remember yesterday I was walk I was actually in the library studying because inshallah I'm taking um, the LSAT soon, and so I was in the library studying, Good and luck with that, there the was Jazakallah <laughs> khair <laughs> and thank you. Definitely the du'as. I was in the library walking through the young adult aisle and they have these pamphlets that tell you, oh, you know, reads for young adults. And they have these different categories and one title caught my eye. I don't remember exactly what it was, but the description, it sounded very typical, like conservative Muslim parents, the children are hiding something and, you know, they need to be, the story is about like being accepted, right? And I think there, even when you have Muslims in media, you, people have to be very clear and very understanding of what it really means to be a Muslim. I think people have this idea of either we're oppressed or we're terrorists, or they still try to portray us in a way that's not honest to who we are as a people. Like we're dynamic, we're complex. You have people on the conservative side, you have people on the liberal side. Um, and, and people have a tendency to talk about Muslims as if like it's, it's a very you know, superficial construct, like we just, we eat different foods, we dress differently, and it stops there, when that's not the case. Um, and so it, I do think it's gotten better, but I still think it's lacking in that we're not portrayed in a dynamic way. Our characters often fall flat. They don't have any type of struggle, aside from either what I mentioned, the oppression terrorist narrative, or the narrative of like, you know, our parents' generation was super strict and now we're woke, like that type of narrative, which I find issues with both. Um, so inshallah, moving forward, I hope that people are more aware of, you know, the, the nuances that come with writing about a group of people. Um, and then also just being able to talk about Muslims in a way that's not, you know, exoticizing them, that's not, you know, orientalist but also you know gives them the nuance that they deserve so sister here you mentioned uh the orientalist touch in regards to media and the specific narrative uh that's given to muslims uh, whether it's uh whether it shows like rami or um previously muslims being depicted as terrorists how would you offer uh, or how would you foresee a solution to altering the narrative to where we can accurately depict muslims uh, on a on a media like a large scale mm, that's a really good question when a lot of the controversy came about specifically around the halal movie because i know that was a very recent uh issue that came up and there was a she's i don't know how to pronounce her last name sara al-fagi fagi fagi but she's a muslim like comics illustrator she does a lot of um like illustrations for different graphic novels and things like that and she mentioned that part of the problem is, is just simply the lack of breadth of um, media or entertainment books, whatever, around Muslims. And because of that, each book, each show is kind of holded to standards where we're kind of expected to, for it to address everything, right? We're expected it for it, like we expect it to address every aspect of the Muslim community. We expect it to address address every issue and she said that until people are co consciously producing media producing works producing illustrations in this realm then that that burden of a minority isn't going to go away you know because a lot of the feedback that you will hear is like okay this type of story about a Muslim girl falling in love with a white boy may be true I'm sure that people go through that but the impression that gives to most viewers that's where the concern lies. Like, we don't want that impression being given to viewers. We don't want to portray that narrative. We don't want to give off that impression of, you know, once again, a Muslim woman being saved by, you know, the white man, right? But we have to balance that between authenticity. And I think that's somewhere, that's a one place I'd really like to research into is to what degree can we tell honest stories? Like, yes, these are struggles that Muslims face. These are, you know, things that Muslims are going through. But at the same time, like, we want to be able to give people who aren't familiar with Islam and Muslims an idea of what the average Muslim is like, right? And so one solution that was offered is just like, we need to produce more. And so that burden of minority is taken away, right? Like if I read a novel about, um, you know, um, you know, middle-class white girl, I never assume that to be 
most middle-aged white girls or sorry not middle-aged middle-class white girls because i know enough there's so much content out there about them that one novel doesn't become a representative like a rep- representative i hope that makes sense yeah no that makes sense uh for sure especially i don't know i've read a lot of young adult novels like aimed towards uh, like that have a muslim character in it or a muslim protagonist and half of them at least or even more is like about exactly like you said uh, a muslim girl who like you know falls in love with a white boy and for sure that that happens in real life but i feel like that could also be harmful for like you know their their self image and then also just like make every white boy feels like the hijabi girl in his class has a crush on him right mm-hmm. which yeah exactly this is problematic like i i very much agree with your point about diversifying the image uh, of muslims in media to like better represent the dynamic demographics of muslims themselves so sister here do you do you ever feel as though the issue lies with uh, just explaining the islamic paradigm to um the the broader world in the sense that um the Islamic paradigm doesn't necessarily align with the postmodern liberal uh, paradigm itself. So do we have to present that first before we show even the intricacies or the nuances within individuals' lives? Because I understand the need to humanize uh, a, a Muslim protagonist to show that we're not so much different. But at the same time, should we also not be introducing Islam as it is to viewership? Oh, I absolutely agree. And I'm actually quite critical of the idea that we need to present Muslims as like, oh, we're not that different from you because it, it, why should people have to be like you for you to accept them? Right. So that's one thing. And the thing that you mentioned about presenting the Islamic paradigm. So one, I can give a concrete of exa- example of where I ran into this problem. And since then, I don't think I have a solid answer but hopefully, you know, maybe we can discuss this further. But um, a couple months ago, I know with like, you know, Khashoggi's murder, and I know this is getting more political, but um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise his reins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so I, I, I wrote a short thing about the responses that were coming out of this were a lot of Muslims calling for boycotting Hajj. And I wrote a short thing about how we have to be careful about making these calls that have to do with fulfilling our rights towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because social justice in the Islamic paradigm is not like social justice within the liberal paradigm. You know, for in, in that paradigm, protesting, boycotting makes sense. But when, it, when, it, when it's about, you know, certain aspects of faith, it, it's very, it, we have to be more careful. And that was my approach. I was like, look, I'm not a scholar, so I'm not saying, you know, but we have to be careful. We can't just call for a boycott of Hajj, you know? And a journalist came across that thread that I had written and she messaged me asking, you know, can you appear on this, you know, short five minute radio interview? We're going to have a sheikh on and we're also going to have someone who takes the position, like a Muslim, who takes the position that we should boycott Hajj because of all the atrocities um, that's been happening there. And so I, you know, talked to a few people. I talked to Imam Khalid Griggs, who works with ICNA Social Justice, and I talked to other people, and they were like, you know, Hira, you're at a crossroads because you cannot really convince people who don't believe that God is part of, you know, social, like God has a part to play in social justice of the importance of fulfilling, you know, hajj right? Like there's no way you can do that if a population doesn't believe or doesn't see the importance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his guidelines when it comes to our daily life. How are you going to convince them that, you know, we shouldn't be boycotting Hajj or we should be more careful when it comes to that, right? And that's something that I continue to struggle with is this reconciliation between the Islamic paradigm and the sort of secular humanist liberal paradigm that we've kind of you know, we kind of live in is when someone's coming from a different perspective and they're, let's say like this, they're, we're playing a chess game, right? If their chess game doesn't even have a certain rule that I consider to be a rule, how are you going to meet them? You know, like in the middle. So if I see this in terms of media, 
yes, we do need to explain, you know, these are the principles from an Islamic standpoint. These are the principles that Muslims try to align their lives, their morals, their values, their clothing, their behavior with. And then within that, these are the nuances that human, you know, Muslims are humans. Obviously, we're not going to hit every single thing perfectly. It, it takes time, especially when people are not exposed to Muslims. You haven't been around to, with Muslims. When you do see a single Muslim here and there, you tend to like assume, oh, this person's just like us in every, like, you don't, it's hard to think outside of your paradigm. It's hard to think outside of your worldview. And I think worldview building, even for Muslims, is difficult enough in a, in a, in a Western country. So to do that and to kind of show that to a non-Muslim audience, I think is a very heavy task. Um, if you, if you have any, you know, directions or solutions on that, I think this is an area of discussion that's very well, that's very needed for sure. So I think uh, you've you've t- we've touched on you know mainly entertainment so far. We've talked about like movies and TV shows and and books and you know forms of entertainment there that Muslim stories are portrayed in uh, a skewed from a skewed perspective. But I mean I know uh, also that you've published uh, the list of Muslims who uh, who have condemned terror attacks, uh, and I know that you might have some experience in like traditional uh, sort of news media and. Uh, from what I understand, a lot of Muslims have this uh, conception that, you know, Fox News is bad, like CNN is good or something, or like, I don't know, NPR is good. And the first time I realized that uh, this wasn't the case and like that everybody's portraying our stories in, in a, from a skewed perspective is when I was listening to a story on NPR about uh, Ilhan Omar and how she had condemned uh, the, the American Israeli Political Action Committee. And they brought on a Democratic uh, congressman and they were just kind of uh, sort of bashing her. And that's when I realized that um, it's not just Fox News or, uh, you know, these sort of right wing uh, uh, news organizations that that contribute to people having a a skewed perspective of Islam and uh, issues pertaining to Muslims. It's just that everybody has uh, is portraying Muslims and Islam and from a different point of view. So uh, what is your like um, experience with uh, with that? So Muslims need to be careful of being instrumentalized because in the end, politics is, you know, politics and each party has their own end goal. And, you know, I'd like to give Hosna Tan that, you know, a lot of people, they tend to be on, people who tend to be on the left, they tend to be, a you know, when it comes to minority rights and when it comes to advocating for minority rights are more active for sure, you know, and they've done a lot of good in that regard, whether it's, you know, Trump's Muslim ban, but we cannot, you know, completely align ourselves and kid ourselves into thinking like all of them have our best interests at heart. And just as you pointed out, this comes to light when it comes to uh, Philistine, when it comes to Palestine. Um, in the end, in, in many cases, of course, I don't want to generalize like an entire party or anyone, but um, they accept Muslims who don't push the boundaries. You know, they don't, you'll see that Muslims who often get into these positions you know, it's it's hard. A lot of people talk about political expediency, like how do you maintain principle as a Muslim? And like, pract- you know, on a practical level, how do you make it in these spaces? And oftentimes you do have to sacrifice a little of that principle to get there because they don't want Muslims who are pushing the boundaries ideologically speaking or politically speaking, but they're just Muslim enough so it, they can give off the impression of the universality of their principles. Does that make sense? Right, right. Like a token Muslim. Yeah, exactly. A token Muslim. Um, And we have to be very wary of that. And, you know, the left, a a lot of them, you know, the way that they really, um, you know, (laughs) left Ilhan Omar under the bus, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar under the bus was not okay. You know, like, oh, you know, we're so glad we're, we're so woke. We have all these people of color in our party. We have all these minorities in our party. Moment one is saying something like they didn't even give any, you know, uh, room to look at what she was saying with a with like a unbiased critical eye like what is she trying to say about this conflict instead they you know chose um party politics and and whatever looks you know respectability politics in it and it's really sad that this is the case like that we can't um our opinions aren't taken seriously and they're we're just kind of there to be the one brown person in the room how do we change that it it takes time and, it, and you know, alhamdulillah, with social media and news kind of becoming something that you can individually 
partake in and talk about. Um, a lot of people, I think, are coming to that realization. Because after that happened, many people came out and were like, this isn't okay. The way that she's being attacked isn't okay. Um, so alhamdulillah, hopefully that means we're moving in a better direction. But being wary of poly party politics and not kidding ourselves into thinking that everyone is going to have our interests at heart. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Kind of along the same lines, Ilha Nomar is is a is a congresswoman. You uh f- like have a have a national presence on on Twitter and across social media uh, for your work with Muslims Condemn. But like you mentioned, you also were the president of your uh, college MSA. In your view, Muslims, you know, being I don't know, probably one percent or even less of the United States population, what's more effective, and what have you found uh, more effective in in your experience, engaging with the whole country, you know, whether it be through elections or or, or you know a big media presence, or community building and reaching out to those closest to you? Like, wh- what should we prioritize as a as a small community? Uh, as a small percentage of the population, in your in your opinion, mm, that is a very good question. You know, I, I don't want to uh, like <laughs> you know opt out of this question, but you know, <laughs> on one level, Muslims should be doing everything. We need Muslims in one sphere. We need Muslims in another f- sphere. We need Muslims in the arts. We need Muslims. But in my experience, though, I I I think our priority because of you know our history in America and you know, arguably the past generation, I know in my parents' case, they came to the U.S. with the intention of going back to India. And a lot of, you know, young people that I talked to, this was the case for our parents' generation. They didn't expect themselves to be here long term. So, and they were so busy with just trying to make a living that there wasn't a lot of investment into community building and infrastructure, you know, those foundational, like only now have we seen like proper full-time Islamic schools and a lot of you know now we have Zaytuna College accredited college in the U.S. Muslim liberal arts the first one and the only one right now right and only now in our generation have we seen like these seminaries and a lot of these you know institutions pop up Um, and I think we're still in a position where we really need to make sure our foundation is solid before we go on to um, you know being involved on a national level, not that it's mutually exclusive. It's not that we need to be a hundred percent there before we can do that. But if we're going to be Muslim voices on a national level, we need to make sure that both internally, like as individuals and externally as a community, our belief is sound, that our understanding of the deen is sound, that we can, um, that we're trying our best, you know, that we're not just going off, you know, and, and going on because again, as a minority, we have that burden for now. And so the last thing that we need is someone um, or any of us to kind of start talking about things and potentially like say something wrong or incorrect and give off the wrong impression to um, everyone, because that's something we're going to be held accountable, accountable for in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when I was in MSA, this was um, in 2017. Yeah, 2017 was when I was, um, was my year. And this was around the time when our MSA was struggling. A lot of the people who are active had graduated the year before. And so I was left with like a, you know, in a rough patch with just a mishmash of students. We weren't really a cohesive group. And so that year for me was very much, you know, talking to people about getting a prayer room set up for us, trying to get a bigger office, trying to get resources out there, trying to print out brochures with just like the basics of halal restaurants in the area. How do you get to the masjid? A lot of these foundational things, um, and they're very crucial when you want to build a community that's active and proud to be Muslim. It has to start at like the very basic level of prayer, of joining with one another and doing good things, volunteering at different, you know, we volunteered with Habitat for Humanity, went to, we went to the Boulder Homeless Shelter with the local masjid, so things like that, and we overlook those things, but those are very crucial for developing a sort of cohesive bond with the community, because only then can you, you know, as a community, become a driving positive force. So I totally agree with you. That's a very good point. And actually, it's similar to uh, what Sheikh Mikael Smith was talking about uh, in, in the last season. He had some really interesting uh, observations on Islamic, uh, on, sorry, on Muslim uh, participation in, in local community and in 
uh, the urban cores and so on. So going off of that as well, uh, you also, you know, because of uh, your work with uh, in starting Muslims Condemn, you won the Muhammad Ali Confident Muslim Award from Yaqeen Institute, the, the first uh, recipient of that award as well. So um, how, how do you feel then about institutions that are starting up and now finally in the Muslim community in terms of like the academia that they choose to teach. You mentioned in the uh, earlier uh, a difference in paradigm between uh, the Islamic understanding of the fundamentals of life and the difference between that and the the Western paradigm, let's say. How do you feel these institutions are doing in addressing this difference because this difference is something that we we are hearing a lot about on this podcast like with the Stad Isa in season one and then Sheikh Mikhail last season what are your thoughts on this kind of general difference between the western paradigm and the Islamic paradigm so let me reiterate to make sure I understood this question correct yeah sorry I got wordy over there no no it's okay <laughs> so you're asking about the role of these institutions and how they've been addressing these two paradigms or uh, yeah, basically that's it. Mm-hmm. So I, I've only really so I spent um, a summer at Qalam or Qalam Institute their their Quran intensive program and then I did their Sira intensive program with Sheikh Abdul Nasser. So that's the extent of my experience with um, quote unquote traditional learning institutions. Um, and I have a few friends who are studying or have studied at Zaytuna college and I'm actually in the Bay Area so I'm not too far from Zaytuna and I know people who are at Dal Qasim in Chicago I know someone who's um what was it Taysir Seminary um and so I I have a pretty good network of people who you know come out of these institutions and really benefited from them and what I see is you know it's it's absolutely like a great um, part of our community, and I really hope. I know Sheikh Yasser Qadi is starting a, a, a or his institute, Institute of Islamic. Yeah, it's the, the Islamic Seminary. Yeah, it's it's the Islamic Seminary of America. Yeah. And I remember, or yeah, I think this was a few weeks ago. Um, he posted a Facebook post in response to a lot of people like seeing his syllabus and seeing like, why are you, why does your syllabus have a lot of non-Muslim authors, right? And he put you know, in his post, he clarified that, you know, our aim is to produce, um, you know, individuals who can talk about, like, what Islam is, but also, you know, really, you know, grapple with the, the West, you know, like, we live in the West, and these are what they're learning, these are their books and their teachings, and there's a lot of good we can glean from that. But we also need to be able to handle these, um, you know, issues that are very specific to modernity, right? Like, whether it's political when it comes to abortion and the issue, you know, abortion, feminism, LGBTQ, um, or whether it be more philosophical, like, or I mean, I guess both of them can be both, but atheism and, and um, sort of that, you know, debates around there. And so we need to produce people who are very competent and are able to speak their language and, and give dawah on that front. So I think that's a really good thing that's been happening is people acknowledging like this is a part of our, you know, country, and this is, you know, we can't, as Muslims, run away from that. But I'm also very, you know, happy to see institutions who are preserving more of a traditional approach. And the reason I say that's important is because a lot of, like, our understanding of the deen, you know, it is, is it, it depends on this, right? It depends on people who are well-versed in classical fiqh texts and classical aqidah texts. It really depends on them. You know, we, you know, most, you know, in Boulder, we only had access to one sheikh, right? We didn't have, it's a very small community. And so a lot of our religious knowledge growing up, you know, we'd go to school on the weeks, during the weekdays, in the weekends, we'd go to the masjid and there was one person who knew, like, who could kind of answer our questions about, you know, prayer, questions about hijab, and we need those people. So I'm glad that the U.S. Muslim community is recognizing recognizing this need for both that we need people who are very well trained in classical texts but we also need people who can you know tackle on like in academia for example example dr jonathan brown is one of the few people him dr obamiranjum they're one of the few people that i can think of that 
are practicing Muslims in academia. And academia is a whole nother, like, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, a whole mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, issue. And so I'm glad that U.S. Muslims are recognizing this need of we need Muslims there. We need Muslims who are um, competent in, in more sort of, you know, pure traditional religious knowledge. We need Muslims who are a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, well-versed in academic texts in the academic world. And, you know, of course, this is with the acknowledgement that the two aren't necessarily um, opposed or like at odds with each other. But I'm really glad to see that these institutions, Zaytuna College, for example, accredited um, liberal arts university, their curriculum has everything from like Arabic to astronomy to fiqh. And so it's, it's, inshallah, hopefully only a good thing for Muslims moving forward. So we're producing a generation that's very well rooted in Islam, but can also, you know, grapple with a lot of the problems of modernity, inshallah. So uh, we keep bringing up uh, the the point of uh, how we need Muslims to diversify in their, you know, their career. Like we talked about in the beginning of the podcast, we talked about <clears throat> we talked about how we need people to uh, go into the arts uh, to start creating Muslim stories uh, from the Muslim perspective so that, you know, we have more visibility uh, in, you know, Muslim media. And uh, we just talked about how we should have more Muslims in, in academia and whatnot. And uh, so from my personal experience, I still think that there's a lot of people that are just doing, you know, the, the classic three prong thing, right? Uh, you either do, you either become an engineer or doctor or lawyer. So what is, in your, in your opinion, what is the, what is the solution to this problem that we have in our communities? You know, I really don't like pushing the narrative of, you know, the previous generation versus our generation. But one place where I do think there's some, um, you know, we can give credence to a lot of, you know, this discourse is the situation our parents were in was very different. Um, And especially for a lot of people today, like a lot of refugees, a lot of immigrants, for them, their immediate need is just to stability, financial stability. Right. But for those of us who have the luxury to to choose then I think we get to a point where, okay, there is room and there should be room to um, move into other realms. And one thing I often say is I don't really see the purpose of Muslims, you know, becoming doctors and engineers in droves if some of them aren't at least producing paradigm changing work. And what I mean by that is I'm, um, my degree is in molecular biology. And so a lot of people in my department go on to do medical school, right? And many of them will inevitably go on, do med school, do the residency, and then work for the rest of their lives. And alhamdulillah, you know, there's that's very noble work, mashallah. But at the same time, you know, there's places like bioethics where we need Muslims to be there so they can be the ones to put, you know, to establish guidelines as to how we should use new technologies like gene editing. And these are all people don't think that this is a threat, but it will become a threat soon, you know. And we want to be the ones who are setting the, the guidelines. I truly believe as Muslims, we have something that, to offer that no one else does. Um, we have, alhamdulillah, we have, you know, um, like an entire body of literature that can kind of guide our discussions around bioethics specifically. So why aren't we there? You know, why should we settle for just being another doctor when there is a place where we can really make, like be the ones to set the precedent? Um, and of course, this is, you know, everyone should go where you know uh it where their temperament most suits them and this isn't to say that everyone who's becoming a doctor is just becoming another doctor that is a really noble field but we have to think a bit bigger we have to think beyond just um you know family stability and individual stability but think on a level like umma for like at the level of an umma right what are we trying to do for our umma and so Oh, no, continue, continue. I've rambled. No, no, I, I've made my point, alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you made an amazing point because uh, I myself, I, I'm actually going to medical school next year. So uh, in regards to the point of uh, young Muslims going into medicine or engineering or becoming a lawyer or um, any of these fields that for the most part their parents push them into, uh, you reminded me of a, of a point uh 
that was written by Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawzi, rahimahullah, in which he, he mentions in his book uh, specifically about physicians and how we can kind of help the ummah at least. And he mentions, uh, he is not a doctor who does not examine the righteousness of the sick person's heart and encourages him to strengthen his soul and body by performing righteous good deeds, such as charity and being interested in drawing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and acquiring the good of the hereafter. So I, I just, you know, I just felt like that. That really reminded me of the fact that, um, at least within the Muslim community, we, we pushed uh, so heavily on the secular education that we leave out. Like we leave out even within medicine, you could at least for, for a Muslim doctor, you could at least learn prophetic medicine. So that way, when you are, when you are performing, uh, surgeries or you are actually giving advice to, uh, Muslim patients or even non-Muslim patients, or even, uh, when it comes to specific, uh, medical treatments advised by the prophet, he said, Islam, you could perform, uh, clinical experiments or clinical trials, you know, to even, even as Muslims, we know that this is the truth, but we could provide the scientific data to to further that you know those those truths as well so i i think that's that's just another point that i wanted to toss on no that's a really good point is the quote from um the prophetic medicine because i just recently got that book uh yeah uh, okay, to inshallah. Inshallah, yeah okay yeah and, and i will read that book inshallah for sure then you no know, you're right it you know if you're going to be a doctor if you're going to be a lawyer if you're going to be an engineer do it with a like a like a steadfast like a sort of you know, passion with this, I'm doing this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And like you said, we have all this information, we have all these, you know, um, like understanding of like the soul and metaphysical aspects of well of medicine, you know, Dr. Rani Awad, she's um, a, a professor and, you know, she has a Muslim mental health lab at Stanford. And she was, she's doing amazing work in this regard where she's, you know, secularly trained, she went to med school, and she's, you know, she can, she works in psychiatry or therapy, but she does it with a, a sense of like, you know, this is what Islam says about the soul and spiritual well-being and that mental health well-being. And she kind of integrates that into her knowledge, right? And so she has an approach that's very unique and she can serve the Muslim community in a way that nobody else can. Um, and that's the kind of, um, you know, motivation that we need to have. Whatever field that we go into is not with okay, I'm going to be a doctor and, or I'm going to be a lawyer and inshallah, like I'll be like every other lawyer. No, we want to be like no one else because we have something that is unique, inshallah. We asked Zabel Khan this same question last week uh, that, you know, we'd like to ask you. So we're three guys over here, you know, uh, and all all American born, quite quite privileged, you know, I think <laughs> we're still, we're still uh, uh, people of color, but, you know, uh, I think we have a bigger say, you know, whether it be in our communities or in the greater, uh, you know, broader country, probably more than uh, you would as a woman anyway. So what can we do with our privilege to make sure that, you know, people of people who are more marginalized than us can be given more visibility in our communities and uh, in media in general? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think, you know, in my experience, you know, when I was MSA president, I was the only female on our board. I was the president and the vice president, treasurer and secretary were all men. Um, And one thing that I really appreciated from them was they knew when they respected my expertise enough to support it and not feel a need to, you know, they knew when to step in, they knew when to support me but they also knew when to let me you know focus on my work and do what I need to do because I was the expert you know and this isn't inshallah like an arrogant way but I think this happens a lot even with non-muslims at work I've had these conversations with my co-workers where sometimes you know it's it's like you said it's hard as women maybe it's because maybe it's my personality maybe I'm more soft-spoken maybe it's because something to do with being a woman but we have a tendency to kind of move away like we don't like to be confrontational we don't like to be forthcoming and and men often you know really uh, benefit from that in working environments and so one thing I would say is to really be aware of you know what the good in the, the good that the women in your community are doing and really shine light on that like these are our sisters in Islam this is the good that they're doing let's you know hold them up let's support them let's give them their voice like we don't need to give them a voice let's give them a microphone so their voices can be heard um you know sharing the work that we do and and really in the end making dua for us because 
you know, especially women who wear hijab, they're visibly Muslim everywhere they go. And that's why, you know, anti-Muslim fanatics go after the women because they're the ones who, who are seen to be visibly Muslim. So make dua for them, protect them, support them. And I know that's like, those are very vague, like <laughs> guidelines, but it really does depend on the community that you're from. But in the end, you know, we are allies of one another and, and inshallah, like that's what you can offer to us is protection and support and, and just really making sure that our voices are heard. So uh, uh, just to follow up on that, I assume that this protection doesn't just extend to real life, but also to social media where it is incredibly easy to harass people. And you as uh, you, you have quite a big uh, social media presence. Uh, I'm sure uh, you must have, I don't know, come across this unfortunate you know, daily happening sometime. How can this protection extend to the social media realm rather than just real life? Uh, stepping in, if you see, you know, just, I don't know, online brings out a lot of very gross comments, especially when I talk about Indian politics. For some reason, you know, the, the BJP, the, whenever that the BJP supporters get involved, I have never seen such nasty comments from Trump supporters as I have from BJP supporters. Um, and, you know, being a woman, you get, I, I'm sure you can imagine the sorts, like the kind of comments that you get. And so if you see something like that, oftentimes these people don't respect a woman enough to to be like, I shouldn't even be making those comments. And so if I say something, they don't care. And often it's a, it takes a man who steps in and, and says like, hey, and shuts it down. And, and sometimes even then they're going to keep going. But you know, being able to be like, hey, this is not okay. This is not acceptable. And especially if you say, see Muslims who are doing this, like, hey, we're Muslims. Like, there is no room to behave like this or say something like this. And there was there was a really good example. There was, um, you know, unfortunately, a sister, she posted a picture and a lot of people took it and put it on a like, very inappropriate website. And there was a brother who's a complete stranger, but he realized a lot of Muslim women's pictures were being posted on the website. And, and instead of a lot of comments that were like, oh, you shouldn't have posted anything in the first place, which is a different discussion to have. This brother went and he went and reported those, you know, use those accounts and he got them banned and he got those pictures removed. Right. So and I think that's such a great example of like just doing something for your brother or sister in faith. So, Sister Hero, we were um, we know you do. You are currently very busy with your LSAT studying, uh, but we were just curious uh, if you happen to have anything else going on in your life that you'd love to share with us and also our listeners as well. Alhamdulillah, it's you know I've taken a step, a little bit of a step back from a lot of the other work that I've been doing, especially because I'm it, I'm in the middle of a bit of a career change, hopefully. Um, but right now, you know, I write when I can. You can find my writings on Medium. I write for once in a while for Amalia, amalia.com. It's aimed towards Muslim women, but you know, there's a lot of um, go work on there. And then most recently I write for Traversing Tradition. And um, that's where I write more about like bioethics and sort of, you know, more politics. And I actually did review Sheikh Mikhail Ahmed Smith's book on there. So you can find my writings there. And then just uh, on Twitter, that's where I'm very active. So anything recent, I'll post there. Well, Sister Hero, we wanted to um, we wanted to thank you so much for joining us and uh, thank all of our listeners for tuning in to the fourth podcast again. Uh, for our listeners, be sure to give us a follow on Instagram at the4th.productions and Twitter at the 4th underscore prod, B-R-O-D. And be sure to join us next week for the final episode of this season. As of now, we hope you have a great day.